This is A View from the Bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. The three numerals 911 have a very specific meaning here in these United States. It's the numbers you dial on your phone when there's an emergency. It also has a scriptural relevance, and we will talk about that over the next 45 minutes or so. Welcome to A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. If you're watching on YouTube, God bless you. Subscribe, click the bell for notifications, and share that link with your friends. But then uh, stick around, because toward the end of the program, we'll tell you how to guarantee we never get canceled, as has happened again to Skywatch TV for the fourth time. Uh, We can prevent that. We have an app, and we will not be canceled from our app, but we'll talk about that at the end of the program. Uh, Joining us today, a couple of men I am honored to call my friends. Most of the folks that are on this program are my friends. That's one of the benefits of being the hosts and doing your own uh, scheduling. Um, One is a Pulitzer Prize-nominated journalist. The other is a pastor, a singer, a podcast host whose podcast is over 250 million views, Uh, And uh, they have put together a new book that you will want to add to your reference library called Revelation 911. And we welcome to the program Troy Anderson and Pastor Paul Begley. Gentlemen, thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much, Derek. It's great to be be on. And, and, under, Derek. And, and I should mention here up front as well, for the benefit of our friends, uh, Mike Kerr and Jeannie Moore, that uh, Paul will be seeing you and Heidi at the uh, Prophetic Signs in the Heavenlies yes. Conference here in just a couple of weeks in Dallas. So we'll talk about that just at the end of the program. And, yeah. yeah. We are it's living in good. significant times, significant times. Revelation 9 1 1. And I see that you cite the verse right up in the uh, introduction, right up front. Uh, they had as king over them the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon and in Greek is Apollyon, that is, destroyer. Revelation nine one one. Paul was. Uh, h- how did this uh, inspiration come to you for this particular book, and uh, what is the relevance of that particular verse? Yeah, uh, I was actually taking a nap. It was the summer of twenty twenty one. Can you imagine that? Trying to trying to get a break here, and uh, the Lord came to me in a vision. Actually, I was asleep, but then I was waking up out of the sleep when He came to me in an open vision and showed me in red letters Revelation nine one one. And then I heard the Lord speaking to me, not audibly, but in my spirit. And he said to me, it is upon mankind. It is upon mankind. Okay. It is upon. In other words, it's about to happen. Go tell the people, write a book, which I had not uh, ever had a book published ever. So when I came out of this, uh, out of the spirit and, and began to think, what in the world is 911? Why, why? What's this? I went to the Bible and opened it up, read Revelation 9-11, as you just said. And it's about, of course, Apollyon uh, or, and coming out of Abaddon, or in other words, the destroyer coming out of the place of destruction. It's amazing. You're writing a book right now called The Gates of Hell. Um, and the, what I began to notice was, uh, Derek, is this chapter, even though I'd read Revelation many times, thousands, I, mean, I don't even know how many times, this is one chapter that I kind of would read and say, oh. And just skip over it. Just Mm -hmm. try not to deal with it because you got these locusts and coming out of this bottomless pit and you got all this darkness and you got this character who's going to literally what he does is he sets free, you know, those uh, angels under the river Euphrates and he creates a six trumpet war that kills a third of the world. This was not a a great message. It didn't it's not a feel good message. I didn't want to do anything with it. But the Lord said, study it write a book. And uh, after some time of researching and prayer, uh, I knew I needed help. I needed help writing this to do it right, to do it uh, comprehensively and give it the credibility needed. And so after praying, the Lord spoke to my wife and I and said, hey, Troy Anderson. So I called him, told him what the concept of the book was. He said, give me seven days to pray about that one. He came back seven days later and said, yes. So then we went on a two-year journey of writing it. So it's it's been a great experience, really. But this is a powerful, that is the crux of the reason. What is coming out of that pit and why? Mm-hmm. Now, Troy, you've written uh, several books uh, dealing with Revelation with uh, Colonel David Giamona, also uh, Paul McGuire. Um, what was it about uh, Paul Begley and his uh, reference to Revelation 9-11? What was it about this that attracted you to this project? Well, uh, Derek, you know, when he called me and he, and he told me about this idea and this this vision he had, Revelation 9-11, I actually flashed back to when I was a little kid, uh, the Kiss Destroyer album. I remember seeing that on a, 
record rack when I was like, you know, 12 years old or something like that. And they had this image of the, the Kiss guys striking this like this triumphant pose. And behind them is like a, a world that's been destroyed, burning. And it's called the Destroyer album. And that's what, you know, Revelation 9-11 is about. So I actually thought about that. I saw that image in my mind. And then, I you know, I prayed about it for a week. And actually, I did, I did some research. You know, does this chapter, I mean, so it's got to be one of the most enigmatic chapters in the book of Revelation. And you sort of usually skip over that one because it's, it's, it's so terrifying, really. And so I did some research in it. And it turned out that um, uh, the guy who was Chancellor of Dallas Theological Seminary for many years, um, I'm not grabbing his name right now, but I have his Prophecy Knowledge Handbook. And he actually talks about there in his expository that he believes this is an actual unleashing of demonic entities upon the earth during the tribulation. Then I found this sermon from Pastor Greg Laurie, and he was saying the same thing. And then Dr. Mark Hitchcock, who's a, a best-selling author and a, a professor at Dallas Theological, he said the same thing. And I thought, wow. And, and then, you know, the, you know, the Lord had given Pastor Bailey this vision. And I just and then I also remembered that when Re, Re, my book with Colonel Giamona came out, the military guide Armageddon, we didn't time it, but it came out a day after or, or day before the Capitol insurrection and shot up to like, you know, 129 on, on Amazon. And uh, so I just I just felt that uh, perhaps we really are on the verge of these events of revelation. I've been investigating this for a dozen years. And now we got this eclipse coming up. You know, so it's just like the sort of mind boggling kind of things, you know, that, that's that's the way God is. This is uh, Revelation 9 deals, the first part of it anyway, the first 11 verses deal with the fifth trumpet. And this is the star fallen from heaven to earth with the key to the bottomless pit, uh, the abyss. He opens it. These things come out. Uh, Paul, in, in the past, there have been some prophecy teachers trying to figure out what these uh, things are and have uh suggested that maybe these are attack helicopters, that this is a version of a vision of future war. And uh, John in the first century trying to describe what he's seeing and not really understanding the technology of the 20th or 21st century. Um, what is it that convinces you that these are, as uh, Troy said, you know, demonic entities, literal um, supernatural beings that are flying up out of the bottomless pit? Uh, what? Yeah, and I'd al I had always heard that the teaching as well that maybe these were some kind of a te new technology. You know, and there are helicopters that have the ability to shoot out of their tail, you know, missiles, and and uh, we've got all kinds of upgraded technology. But what convinced me was um, the Nephilim walked the earth. We've already had gigantic entities, creatures that were beyond the human scope of imagination, and. They, I haven't been here once, but we find them even after the flood, and they were guarding the Holy Land, trying to stop the children of Israel from the promise that God made Abraham. And they have to deal with these 13, 14, 15, and we don't know how tall they were. So why not some that can fly? Why not demonic forces? Literally, this, this pit of hell has never been opened. As you're reading this in Revelation 9, we haven't had it yet. We're close. That's That was the the vision uh, and the urgency. And, that, and I even felt that that's why 9-11 was so important because it's the urgency of the time. Um, but yeah, I'm convinced they are demonic. I'm convinced they are actual entities, not only in the spirit realm, but we will actually see them. They will fight. I mean, there's a battle of Armageddon coming one day where every creature that hell's got is going to try to over dethrone Christ. But uh you know, it's not going to work. So I do believe, though, that the cloud of smoke there kind of represents the demonic spirits that will will be absolutely causing people and tempting people and destroying people's faith in God and turning each other against each other. I, I believe that is also part of the release. Uh, Troy, how does this uh, how does this timing fit together and how does this um your research for this particular book over the last two years track with what you've been studying for the previous decade? Yeah. So, um, you know, what we try to do in this book is, you know, of course we have a chapter that deals with revelation nine, but a lot of the, most of the book is, is looking at what's happened since the September 11th terrorist attacks, which seemed like a very prophetic event. Remember Rabbi Khan wrote the harbinger right. talking about how this ancient pattern in Israel is repeating today in America, leading to potential judgment. And, and, you know, of course, you know, Israel was uh, overtaken the Northern tribes, you know, 2,600 years ago. So, so we look at all the things that have happened since, uh, September 11th, 2001, that, that 
horrific terrorist attack on the country. And it's this gigantic transformation that's occurred. And so, and so now, you know, after going through all the evidence, trying to make it as easy to understand as possible, uh, it just sort of happens. The, actually, we, we were working on this book for a couple of years, and it was supposed to come out in January, but then the, the publisher bumped it up to April 4th, and then got moved back to March 26th. So now it's coming out right before this eclipse. And uh, as you may recall, I, I did this interview with Billy Graham back in 2013 for a, a seven-part World Net Daily series on possibility of revival, end times revival. And, uh, and Billy Graham had said, when God sent the prophet Jonah to Nineveh to warn them of a pending judgment, that the king and the people repented. And he said he believed the same thing could happen again today in America. Now, so now we flash forward to April 8th, which is coming right up here, and we've got this, this uh, eclipse that runs through all these multiple cities called Nineveh in America. The 2017 eclipse went through a whole bunch of cities called Salem or, or Jerusalem. It forms this gigantic X in the middle of the country, which is uh, in Carbondale, Illinois, or Little Egypt. Mm -hmm. And then if you uh, overlay the 2023 eclipse, it forms the Hebrew letters Aleph and Tab, or Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, the title of Jesus in the last chapter of Revelation. And there's what was it, a comet coming and planetary alignment. And so you know, the book has come out right this time. So uh, is this America's Nineveh moment? And you know, it just sort of seemed like the hand of God is on this book to help, you know, wake up the church, wake up the world to the lateness of the hour. We very well could be on the, the cusp of the events of Revelation. And so, you know, we, we wanted to bring this to people's attention and, and call people, you know, to return to God, just like Billy Graham said. This is our minimum of our chance to turn back to God. Hmm. We, we are certainly seeing, uh, Paul, as I know you uh, describe in your podcast on a regular basis, the uh, great falling away or what I think you could at least make a case that it's a great falling away here in this country as we uh, have uh, just redefined what it means to be um, male and female. Uh, we, we have redefined the institution of marriage. We uh, are calling what is good evil and evil good. And while all of this is going on, we're seeing other things happening around the world with the uh, the coalition forming around Russia and China. Our good friend, Lieutenant Colonel Robert McGinnis, wrote several years ago what is now looking like a very forward-looking, if not prophetic book, Alliance of Evil. Um, how, how do all these signs coalesce in your mind as far as where we are on the timeline? What are the major events in biblical prophecy that we can expect next? I think that... Um... We start with 9-11, the event happened in America, in New York. It changed the world. It definitely changed the world. And then what's happened on really October 7th in Israel is another defining moment. Um, because we know that the Bible told us Israel would become a nation. 1948 was a major milestone as the rebirth of Israel. 1967, Six-Day War, we know that was huge. And then even uh, in 2017, when Trump, President Trump announced that he was... Israel, Jerusalem was the capital of Israel. Again, another defining moment to declare it the eternal city of God. But now this attack on uh, Israel was catastrophic. It was horrible. It was uh, unbelievable, really. Uh, and, but when I got digging deep, well, why did they attack then? And you know, I know it was Vladimir Putin's birthday, but why did they choose that day? And uh, we found out uh, that they called this attack the uh, al Aska Mosque or al Aska Flood, and the uh, the leaders of Hamas said the main reason they did it was because of the red heifers that were in the stall. They were absolutely paranoid that the sacrifice and the burning of the ashes was going to happen this spring, and they, they had to come up with a way to try to stop it. They, they, they are afraid of that event because they know if they get the red ashes of the heifer, the red heifer's ashes, they know that they'll be in position to start building the temple. And this is something they don't want on the, on the Temple Mount. So I know that was big. But if I look at the culture of America, the cancel culture, the uh, as you talk about the transgender movement, I mean, it's an incredible movement where parents have lost parental rights in this country. Uh, when school corporations are, are taking the children and saying, trying to convince them they're of a different sex, uh, when you see uh, the woke agenda completely across our nation, the overrunning of the southern border, uh, and the, re the lawlessness, the crime levels, the disregard for human life. I mean, we really, if you just take a step back and look at our country alone, it is in a state of chaos, of disrespect, lawlessness. 
Uh, and of course, God is nowhere in anybody's plan. I mean, it, it, they don't retain God in their knowledge, as the scripture said. So these are all signs, uh, without a doubt, all of them are signs that uh, the approaching prophetic hour, the hour of uh, judgment even, is coming soon. And uh, our message is to plead, really, is to alert the world. It's 911 time. Mm. Uh, Troy, as a, as a journalist, I know you get your head in the daily news uh, just as much as Paul and I do. Um, as we look around the world at uh, global events, uh, the, the agenda of the globalists, for example, uh, the World Economic Forum, which, by the way, is starting to de-emphasize the phrase Great Reset because they noticed that we caught on to what that is and what it means. It's like, no, 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 that, that's, that's a conspiracy theory. We didn't, we didn't really mean that. But they're talking about things with, with these euphemistic terms like fourth industrial revolution, which sounds great. Hey, technology, that's a, until you read the part where it says a blurring of the lines between biology, technology and the environment. Like, wait a minute. Wait just a minute. Uh, how are these global events and the agenda of the globalists factoring into the unfolding of Bible prophecy? Yeah, so in Revelation 9-11, we actually left a list, 50 Bible verses that Jesus and the prophets told us of, of signs to watch for that would indicate we're moving into the end times. And if you just compare those to the, today's headlines, it's almost like all, almost all of them are so in some stage of fulfillment or been fulfilled or, you know, uh, in that ballpark. And so this, this whole push we've seen, you know, just in the last several years, especially since the pandemic, when when Klaus Schwab announced the great reset of capitalism. And, you know, as you mentioned, you know, a lot of uh, Bible prophecy uh, experts, you know, realized what that was is sort of the, you know, the new version of the, of the new world order. So, yeah, of course, they're going to de-emphasize it now, but that doesn't change the fact that they are pushing for some kind of new global system. We're watching the rollout of digital currencies uh, among over 130 governments worldwide now. So for the first time in history, you could actually have this mark of the beast system that's Revelation 13 talks about where you can't buy or sell with, you know, artificial intelligence and the surveillance state and, you know, microchip implants. Even Elon Musk has, has his neural link of a brain chip implant that they're beginning to, to test out where they can, you know, lay this, uh, uh, this thin little layer over your brain and, and you can, you know, uh, communicate uh, to, the, to the AI, to the, to the, the cloud, you know. I mean, so te technologies are, are, are advancing so fast. And so, you know, 2000 years ago, the Apostle John was trying to describe all this in, in first century language. And I think he did a pretty good job. He talked about the, the image of the beast and the mark of the beast. And so we're, we're seeing all these things happen now. And, and that's just one little aspect, this push for this, you know, world government. You know, they're open about it. You know, world government forums, you know, the Davos meetings. You know, if, if you read their reports, they're, they're talking about we need to have this global systems to prevent nuclear war prevent extreme climate change. We're going to address the, you know, overpopulation issue. So there's a lot of things going on. If you read their documents uh, that they're, you know, they're openly saying this is what needs to be done and, and they're moving, you know, toward that, uh, that in, in that direction. Uh, Paul, it doesn't even need, to, you, you don't even need to be a, a Bible believing Christian or one who really understands that end times prophecy are being fulfilled to look at the globalist movement and see the danger posed by a one world government, the, the uh, threat of tyranny from a global government. Why are so many churches not recognizing, it, it seems to me anyway, not recognizing what's going on and the danger posed, uh, again, just from a geopolitical standpoint, from a one world government, uh, above and beyond the fact that uh, from a, a biblical standpoint, we know that a global government is coming someday. I mean, just from a geopolitical standpoint, you think more churches would be a little more aware of what's going on? Yeah, you really would. And this is a great question, Derek. Uh, I mean, when you when you think about the the Great Reset, like you said, Klaus Schwab don't want to talk about that anymore. But when you think it's it's really old school Marxism uh, dressed up in super socialism. Okay, it's a communistic movement. Matter of fact, we even in the book, we, we discussed the 10 goals of uh, the Communist Man Manifesto. Uh, we'll show you that this every time globalism, globalism is a fancy word for a communist regime that is not just one nation or a group of nations, but it would be an entire world under it. 
it is the biblical uh, beast of Revelation 13. So you would think that the churches and the pastors would say, hey, man, uh, we really didn't want to get into the political world. We just kind of want to be left alone. But they're bringing upon us the exact thing that the Bible said would come in the end times in Revelation 13. We've got to do something. I mean, we've got to start standing up. We've got to go back and take your school boards back, uh, vote, uh, run for Congress. We've got to get involved, you would think, because the founding fathers, they were mostly all ministers of the gospel and strong Christians for the most part, and they heavily influenced the people from the pulpit on how to establish a nation to make it prosperous with an entrepreneur spirit, you know, and, and to excel in capitalism. Every time that communism has tried, it has failed miserably. The only thing it has been great at is establishing a two-tier system, a ruling class, and the rest of us. And that is their goal. That is really Lucifer's goal. So I think it's time, and we're hoping this, this book, actually, we really hope that the people will hand it to their pastors. Pastors are buying it already. I've, I've heard from several saying, hey, uh, I think people are asking me. They're asked, the, the parishioners are asking the pastors now, when are you going to start talking about prophecy? When are we going to talk about things that are happening? You know, when they see Donald Trump lose $454 million yeah. for borrowing money and paying it back, and building, it's sort of like me buying a, um, getting a mortgage on a house. I go to the bank. I say, here's how much I make. Here's my W-2s. Here's my tax returns. Here's how much assets I have. I'd like to buy a house a little bit maybe. And the, and the bank looks at it and says, we think we can take a chance with you. And you loan you the money and you pay it back. Where's the crime? So I think a lot of Americans are starting to say, wait a minute. If that can happen to the former president of the United States, then this is a war on capitalism and freedom. Yeah. And if it's war on freedom, then that includes your family, your faith, and your freedoms that you have. And I think I'm praying that the, there will be a great wake-up renewal among pastors around America. I, I'm smiling as you're saying this, even though it's not really anything to smile about, because it just struck me how ironic it is that the whole point of Marxism, based on critical theory, is that you've got two classes, an oppressor class and the oppressed class. It's just that they want to be the oppressors. And uh, right. as I've as I've often exactly. said, um, being a liberal or being a socialist means never having to deal with cognitive dissonance, because clearly those are you know mutually exclusive <laughs> thoughts. We you know being an oppressor is bad, but we want to be the oppressors. Like, what do you hear yourselves? Well, yeah, they do. Mm -hmm. They don't care. It's it's not about uh, no. um, hypocrisy. It's about hierarchy, and you're not at the top. That's the bottom line. <clears throat> uh, yeah. The, the family seems to be a real target of all of this agenda as much as anything else. Uh, Troy, I know you've got a chapter in the book here dedicated to the family, woke education and cultural Marxism. How are the globalists and these um, uh, those who are trying to drive this globalist agenda? How, why are they attacking the family and how are they doing it? Yes, yeah, so as Pastor Bailey mentioned, uh, there's a very interesting book that came out in 1958 called The Naked Communist by a former FBI special agent, uh, Skuzin. And it actually sold about 2 million copies and President Reagan endorsed it later on. And in that book, he listed 50 things or 45 goals that the communists at that time wanted to implement in America to undermine this country and, and essentially merge us into this Marxist one world state at some point. So if, if you take it, that was 70, almost 70 years ago. So if you take a look at those 45 goals, uh, it's, it's almost like everyone except for using the United Nations to create a one world government is, is you know, being has, has been accomplished, essentially. And a mm -hmm. whole bunch of those goals were like, you know, uh, call, uh, you know, uh, any kind of thing against obscenity and pornography is as censorship. Uh, encourage you know transgenderism, homosexuality, all that kind of stuff. Encourage easy divorce, undermining the family, promoted addictions, and all kinds of things. And so, so the last think about the, the the transformation we've seen in the family, undermining the family marriage in the last several decades. It's been a concerted campaign accomplished, I guess, by you know former Soviet Union, maybe China involved in it, the the global 
globalist around the world, the secret societies, you know that they spent billions and billions of dollars through different organizations, foundations, infiltrating our country, infiltrating the government, media, business, you know, the entertainment industry, and they've accomplished this incredible transformation of America from a, a strong Judeo-Christian uh, society into a, a Marxist, you know, post, uh, you know, whatever, you know, terminology they're, they're using today. And so, uh, and, and the church was asleep, you know, largely as, as this whole thing was going on. And uh, so we, we point this out in the book. And so that, that's why we really want to encourage everybody to read this book, wake up to what's happening. And, you know, the, the Bible tells us if you resist the devil, he will flee. His tactics are essentially intimidation and coercion. And so if we stand up, you know, with the power of God behind us, we can push back against this thing. And that's what Billy Graham saw. He saw if we repented before God, if we turned back to God, we could see a gigantic turnaround. And he was very hopeful of that. I, I was so inspired by that interview. You know, we called for this National Day of Repentance in our book, Trumpocalypse. Our friend, Reverend Kevin Jessup, great networker, he ran with it. He persuaded uh, all kinds of faith and political leaders to get on board. He persuaded Rabbi Khan to uh, you know, be the spokesman. And then it actually happened, the return, National Global Day of Prayer and Repentance, uh, September 26, 2020, the National Mall. Quarter million people showed up, 42 million people watched it. First National Day of Repentance in America since Abraham Lincoln. President Trump issued a proclamation for a day of prayer and return. And so, you know, we're, you know, so Americans responded, you know, a lot of people turned back to God. So we just want to encourage more of that now. And uh, I think we're at this pivotal turning point in, in history. And if, if the church, if the Christians will rise up, be bold, be courageous, we could see a, a big turnaround. We could even see this great re revival that Pastor Bailey's talking about, this great harvest revival. We're seeing sort of signs of it now, but we need to inspire, you know, Christians to join God's army and, and, uh, and do what's right here. Uh, there, there's a chapter in here that is uh, hitting close to home for me. We're we're basically, uh, you know, doing a lot of research that overlaps, uh, as I mentioned, and as you mentioned, Paul, uh, Sharon and I are working on just finishing a book now called The Gates of Hell. My previous book was all about the entity that I think will is Abaddon or Apollyon, um, the right. destroyer. Uh, but you, I've also co-authored a book and working on another book now on the UFO phenomenon. And you've got a chapter in here dealing with fallen angels, the Nephilim, UFOs, the Great Deception. <laughs> Um, a lot of Christians will look at this and think, oh, that that's really fringe. That's way out there. We don't need to deal with that. That's that's for people who like the guy with the big hair on the History Channel. Um, until we point out that, according to research, there are more people who believe that Earth is being visited by E.T. than actually have a biblical worldview, according to George Barna. I mean, Christianity 101, Jesus lived a sinless life, born of a virgin. You can't earn your way into heaven, things like that. Only 9% of Americans, actually, I think it's down to 4% now, 4% of Americans have a biblical worldview, and 36% think E.T. is making collect calls home from Earth. So what is your take? How does this phenomenon fit into the end times? Yeah, you know, uh, and we wanted to take this on because, uh, obviously, thousands of people are having encounters. They it's don't a hot know topic what they're right encountering. Now. Yeah, they, but they really don't know what they're encountering. Uh, they, but they know they're being encountered. They're having uh, visitations. They feel like they've had abductions. They feel that they've been uh, violated. They're seeing crafts and different things in the heavens. And, uh, and uh, so we have to, as a church, we have to address it. We don't, can't run from it and say, well, we just don't want to deal with it. We have to address it. People are coming to our services still affected by these. And so uh, what we did in this book is we talk about how that it's part of the great deception or the strong delusion that's in the Bible, that it's going to be a, it's a tactic that Lucifer's using in the end days to confuse people, to take them away from the creation again. We had Darwinism. Darwinism said we came from a monkey, we came from an ape, whatever. And, uh, and so that worked for about a hundred years. But now, as people have become more sophisticated and they understand DNA analysis and all that, they're saying, whoa, 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 that don't fit. So now we've been seated. The, the lie now is that we have been seated here by uh, extraterrestrial beings from some other planet, some other galaxy, and that they're our creators and that we are now being held accountable by them. 
as they're coming back to teach us and train us because we've got too many nukes and what have you. So once again, it's a message to con- to deceive people away from the creation. And also, that's why marriage is being destroyed, because it's part of God's creation, the multiplication to replenish the earth. Uh, and so, and also your identity, male or female, that's under attack to destroy the creation. So really, I think, I, I, I think that you got to go to Genesis to understand Revelation uh, and ultimately the UFO phenomenon. We felt it was vital that we put this chapter in. We, we included it with fallen angels and Nephilim and, and try to help bring a biblical narrative to it. But uh, there's no doubt. People are having encounters. They just don't understand that these are demonic forces, demon entities, things that uh, principalities and powers and things that Lucifer's using every trick in the book to deceive the world. And we have to tell the truth. Troy, uh, as a Pulitzer Prize nominated journalist working in the secular realm, uh, and I come from a secular media background myself, working as a a news news announcer, top 40 radio guy, and then a a talk show host. Hearing what Paul just said might, back in the day, have gotten you kicked out of the newsroom. Uh, how do you <laughs> respond to things like this today? Uh, claims and accounts of people who claim that they're being either demonically possessed or uh, being attacked or oppressed or abducted by aliens. And I'll put that word in air quotes. You know, that, that brings to mind a, a book I read when I was a reporter at the LA Daily News, uh, Jim, Jim Marr's famous book, The Rule by Secrecy, where he yep. talks about the secret societies and all these different things. And he, he was actually an investigative reporter at the Fort Worth Star Telegram, became a New York Times bestselling author. So one day I walked into the newsroom, I'd only been a journalist there for like two years. And I go, I just read this book, Rule by Secrecy. And I started telling the editor a little bit about you. Shh, we don't talk about that, those kind of things around here. <laughs> so, so yeah, you, you sort of learn. There, there's sort of like this, uh, um, you know, uh, you, you just sort of learn as a reporter in a mainstream journalist outfit. There's only certain things you can cover and talk about. I'm sure it's much worse today than it was back when I was there. And so, but but here, I mean, we've seen this, you know, this transformation of society. Like you mentioned, there's there's far more people who believe in ET and that uh, extraterrestrials are visiting us today. They're actually having congressional hearings where, you know, whistleblowers are claiming that, you know, the government has not only, uh, you know, contacted with, had, had contact with extraterrestrials, but they've had their craft, they've been reverse engineering, a lot of our technologies are coming from that. So this is all being reported in the media now. And so what does this all mean? And th- think about for decades now, all these movies, you know, E.T., Star Wars, hundreds of, of films about this phenomena, the, you know, the ancient aliens show, you know, m- many different documentaries. Netflix just had a UFO documentary series. And so what, what is really going on here? And so could this be part of the powerful delusion? You know, I, I interviewed uh, Hugh Ross at Reasons to Believe. He's an astrophysicist. And he's got a lot of friends who are astrophysicists at uh, JPL and NASA. And so they he, he told us that he believes this is an interdimensional phenomena and his and his fellow phd guys also believe it's interdimensional because it's he, he pointed out that it's pretty much impossible uh, unless alien technologies could somehow use a wormhole or something like that because the nearest planet that could harbor life is so many light years away there's no way they could ever get here and if they and if they could get here they'd have to have a gigantic spaceship and there's so much it's just so dangerous to travel through space that you know, almost any life form would, would have died you know long, long time ago. So, so, but, but yet you have all these people reporting these things and you have these crash sites where they, they find, you know, vegetation that's been knocked down trees and, and stuff like that. Yeah. There's no vehicle there. And so that, you know, it, it, it goes with what the Bible says. There's a spirituality and principalities and powers. It's interdimensional, just like, you know, you read in the book of Enoch that the, uh, the fallen angels gave technology and civilization to early humanity. Now we're seeing the same thing again. It's, just, it's, just, it's the same entities you know just did you know they can you know the bible talks about the angels can can appear as humans they can appear in different shapes both fallen angels and and god's good angels and so i i think that's what they're seeing there there's a there's other dimensions and and many you know the, the, some of the brightest physicists in the world say there's probably 11 different dimensions and so the world is far more complex than what we were taught in school and as you have you know, seen the last few years we are lied to constantly by the media by our government and the schools and so as you awaken to the reality then uh you know things become more clear and it turns out the the bible you know gave us the 
the the actual truth of what you know is really going on and what our lives are really about and it's all in scripture and you know god's the ultimate uh, genius and and uh, master storyteller and i think that's what, what just amazing is that realizing that the ufo true believers are speaking our language as christians we don't need to be afraid of engaging them in those terms like yes let me explain to you. it's it's like mars hill you know i hey i see you're very religious I, and here's let me let me talk to you about the unknown god here <laughs> we got that uh well let's talk about the destroyer now cuz again this is a subject a, a character that i have found very very interesting and that's why i wrote my last book on on uh, this entity trying to trace his career who do you think, Paul, the destroyer is? Do, do we see any evidence of him pr previous in Scripture, or any clues from the pagan cultures around the ancient world? Who do you think this, this character is? I mean, uh, you know, we have seen clues from some of the pagan cultures, like Apollo uh, uh, and others. I mean, I think it's sort of like he keeps coming back with a new name and a new location but it's the same old devil yep. you know it's the same same guy um and he is the destroyer so he does proclaim who he is and we also read about him again in revelation 20 uh and you know when he had he shows up a, uh, an angel shows up again and uh, this time with the key of the bottom's pit and the chains but that time it's coming to wrap them all up and throw them into the lake of fire this apollyon this destroyer he is the, um, let's see, if, if Leviathan is the demon of the, end of the sea, and if Lucifer is the prince of the power of the air, then he is basically the god of the underworld, okay? He is the, he is the conqueror, the, the, the tormentor, the destroyer of humanity, bring misery upon the earth. And so he's sort of like the unholy trinity, if you put those three together. Uh, he's, um, you know, could he be a foreshadow? of the Antichrist himself? Does he possess the Antichrist or does Lucifer do that? Since uh, I think that's probably Lucifer. Is Apollyon Lucifer? It's another question. Uh, certainly he's one of the darkest figures in the Bible. I don't, you know, uh, he's not my favorite guy, uh, but um, uh, we have to take him serious because um, his uh, power to deceive, to torment, to wreck, to destroy, you know, who came to kill, steal, and destroy? But it's Satan himself. So he's really got the characteristics. He's got all of the uh, um, makings of the devil. I mean, uh, so if he isn't Lucifer, he's his kissing cousin, I guess. I mean, he's, he's right there, okay? Well, I think that's one of the things we can credit Mike Heiser with, which is showing us that uh, with the Divine Council worldview that there are more than just, it's not just the devil. He's got minions and uh, so the, the fallen realm yeah. has got a lot more arraigned against us. But even with that, greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. Uh, he's already won the victory. Amen. We're just waiting for final judgment to be carried out. Uh, one of the wars that has been a subject of debate by scholars probably since the time Ezekiel actually put pen to parchment in the 6th century B.C., the uh, Ezekiel 38-39 Gog-Magog conflict, and uh, October 7th kind of brought that back to the fore again, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine also, because there are many who look at the, the map and say the uttermost north, that must be Russia because that's due north of Jerusalem. Um, Troy, how close are we to the Ezekiel 38-39 conflict? Yeah, I mean, think about some of the things we've seen happen in the last few years. We had Russia attack Ukraine. No, nobody thought that was going to happen, and then it happened, and now it's dragged on. And yeah. what I mean, just like you know, wholesale slaughter going now. on over yep. there. Yep. And 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 President Putin is is constantly threatening nuclear war. Just the other day, there was reports of a whole bunch of Russian nuclear subs off the east coast of America. So, I mean, will he use nukes? He 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 very well. I I spoke to my other co-author Colonel Giamone the other day, and the information he's getting is that you know the military is, is taking this threat seriously. And so, I mean, it's a real danger. And then, then the North Korean dictator, Kim Jong-un, he's now threatening to attack uh, South Korea. And, and the government's concerned that, the, you know, we may have to intervene in that situation. And he's got nuclear weapons and he's threatened this nuclear war in the past. Then you have the, the situation exploding in the, in the Middle East with this Hamas attack on Israel and Israel trying to root out all these terrorists now. And, and you know, could that draw Iran? I mean, here, here in Irvine, every Sunday, there's like a, a gigantic hundreds and hundreds of people out in the street, you know, protesting against uh, 
uh, you know, America has an involvement in, you know, trying to back Israel in, in its, you know, effort to, you know, get rid of these terrorists over there. And so the world is a powder keg and, and the Ezekiel, you know, 38 and uh, 39, you know, talk about this potential, you know, gigantic war. So I, does this fit into the, the sixth trumpet war that, you know, that Revelation 9 talks about? Perhaps could, could we be on the verge of World War Three essentially? And uh, if you look at, you know, geopolitical events, I think it's only God that's holding this all back. And, and you know, if you look at different reports on uh, the close calls we've had of nuclear war of the last seven decades. Uh, if you read sort of like the bolt of atomic scientists and their different reports, we've come very, very close to blowing up the entire planet many, many times. And there's only one explanation why it hasn't happened. That's because God has held it back. So that's why it's so important that we, you know, repent and turn back to God because, you know, God's in control. And, uh, but when he decides that, you know, it's time for this prophetic uh, scenario to unfold, then, then it will. And uh, so, mm -hmm. you know, in the meantime, we need to be doing you know, our job as, as Christians to, you know, be, be good soldiers of Christ and, and fulfill the, the, the final instruction Jesus gave us, which is to take the gospel to all the world. That's our, our primary mission. Amen. Amen. Uh, Paul, you Amen. mentioned the, uh, the red heifers earlier, and this is a really interesting development. Of course, the, uh, uh, heifers that were, were unblemished and brought from Texas to Israel last fall or last spring, if I remember correctly. Uh, and the timing on that, if I remember right, because they've got to be at least two years old, would, would it be sometime this fall. They would be ready, assuming they've not been blemished since then, to uh, prepare for the, uh, the ritual described in Numbers chapter 19. Um, the third temple... Um, this is a, a subject of a lot of debate as well. I mean, uh, do, do we need a third temple? Will there be a third temple? How close are we to a third temple? A great question. You're right. It is debated a lot. Tr people trying to understand what will happen. Do we need one? No. We, you know, Christ is now the, the temple. Uh, our body's the temple and the blood of Christ. Will there be one? Yes. Okay. Um, because ultimately for the Jewish people whose eyes we're blinded to allow the Gentiles to get in. They, if, you know, when you're there and you've been there many times, Derek, as, as well as I have, they believe they have to have a temple to where God can then speak to them. And so they're saying until God gives us back our temple, you know, you know, we're really, we're waiting. So it's sort of like they need their temple so they can hear from God. But the Antichrist knows that and he's going to hijack it. Okay. And, and, uh, at some point, walk in and declare, reveal to the world that he is God, you know, before the worshipers of God. Well, before you can build a third temple, you have to have the red, uh, the ashes of the red heifer. And you're right. There were five red heifers found in Texas. Now four of them are still eligible. Um, and I just spoke to one of the leading rabbis last week, made a phone call. And I said, can you tell me what's going to happen here? He said, look, I would love to tell you, Paul, but you know. The reason that we're in a war right now is over this. And there is such high security and con and the, the, the whole world is against us to to divide our land, um, to stop and let Hamas survive and give Hamas half the country. And it's really all over this subject. And I can't say any more for security reasons. I just got to be quiet. I can't tell you nothing else. But just trust me, it's on the table. OK, so. This is a big deal because as um, as evangelical Christians, let's say, we, you know, we're like, let's let's move on. You know, Jesus has already paid the price. He even died during the Passover period. And, and but at the same time, prophetically, the scriptures are kind of leading us. I mean, even Jesus said there's a day coming when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel, the prophet standing in a holy place. Whoever readeth lame understand. He says, you better flee. Don't even go bound and get your clothes. You got to get out of there because it's going to be a horrible day, a time like never before. So it, it is, I assume that he's referring to, he did say the abomination of desolation. And I think in Thessalonians, that basically is referring to the day of the Antichrist, the man of sin, the lawless one, the son of perdition walks in and says he's God. So uh, we're close to that. I mean, we are so close to that happening. So Stay tuned. This is all part of the coming of Jesus Christ. Mm. One final question for both of you. Troy, what do you hope readers will take away from your book, Revelation 9 one 
Well, I mean, the, the greatest thing I hope is that people are inspired. You know, if you think about it in one way, yeah, this is sort of scary, these times we're living in. But as Christians, this is you know really the most exciting time in history to be a believer because Jesus has put us all here at this time as we're watching all these things unfold. And so, you know, I would encourage people to, you know, get, get right with God. That's the biggest message. You know, ask the Lord to forgive you of your sins and then join join God's army. Ask the Lord to show you your, your mission, your assignment in his army. And he, he will. He'll transform your life and, and, and take you through what, whatever is ahead of us here. And Paul, uh, what, what is your hope uh, as, you, as a pastor looking to uh, edify your, your congregation, your flock, those who tune into your, your podcast on a regular basis? What message do you want to share? I want to, I guess, share with them the urgency of the hour, the realization that time as we know it is going to come to a close, that this, that this uh, dispensation of time is about to shift into a new paradigm. And this is the hour for us, us to be completely honest with God, honest with mankind, honest with our, our neighbors and family, and say, look, if you want me to tell you the world's going to get better, I'm, I'm, I can't hardly find it. But I can tell you this, great revival's coming. Many people are going to make that great decision to choose Christ, and you want to get in. It's like it's the last call. The boat's about ready to pull out of the harbor. You better make sure you get in. Uh, we're at that time. And so I hope to encourage the church to actually to light them on fire to, to where they're out there and they're sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, yet to face the world issues wide-eyed, completely wide-eyed. We're not, we're not blinded. We, we are the children of the light. We don't stumble in the dark. We got to know what's going on and we've got the right answer. His name is Jesus. Amen to that. Revelation 911, how the book of Revelation intersects with today's headlines. Paul Begley and Troy Anderson, the authors. Check the show notes below this program. Whether you're watching or listening, you'll find links to the website and also where you can get or their websites and also where you can get a copy of the book. Uh, when is the uh, release date, Troy? Yeah, it's, it's coming out on March 26. It's already hit number one bestseller, number one hot new release. And, you know, it's available, you know, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, pretty much anywhere books are sold. And we've also got a new newsletter, revelationwatchers.com, for a free newsletter where people can you know, get all kinds of great articles, including your articles, Derek. Oh, yeah. wonderful. Oh, cool. Well, yeah. honored to be part of that. And uh, that is just a couple of days away as you are watching this. We're recording this just to timestamp it on March 20th. This will go up on the 24th. So uh, just a couple of days away, you can get your copy of Revelation 911. Uh, Troy, good to talk with you again. We'll be talking with you and uh, Colonel, uh, Colonel Giamona here shortly. And, uh, Paul, we'll see you in Dallas. We'll see you then. Look forward to it. Details on the prophetic signs in the Heavenlies Conference coming up in just a couple of weeks straight ahead. Also, details on a new conference coming to Cincinnati, the Mysteries of the Bible Verse Conference in early June. Details on that and our solidarity mission to Israel. We'll talk about that in just a moment, as well as possibly the worst explanation ever for the sudden nosedive of a passenger jet, resulting in dozens of injuries. Uh, you won't believe what Boeing said was the cause. Bless their pointy little heads. That's straight ahead on A View from the Bunker. It's a new month, and we have a new special at the Gilbert House online store. We have a crazy, crazy deal on all of our DVDs. They are, regardless of the retail price, they are 75% off. We keep hearing from the kids these days that everything is going to streaming video, that DVDs are old school. Oh, not for us. No, we are old school. And besides, we don't trust the internet will always be there. So take advantage of this special offer. Everything from our travel documentaries. Basically, follow us as we go through the Holy Land and show you the important sites at Ground Zero on this supernatural war, plus video teachings, oh, yeah. presentations, and much, much more. You know, with 75% off savings on all the DVDs, as many as you want to get, you've got the money that you save to go out and buy a DVD player. <laughs> That's it. Take advantage of it now online only at the Gilbert House store, gilberthouse.org slash store. And thank you for your prayers and support.
Walking the Walk every Sunday night from the beautiful Missouri Ozarks. This is A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. You'll find us online at vftb.net. That is the podcast homepage. The web hub for everything that Sharon and I do is gilberthouse.org, gilberthouse.org. You'll also find us on social media, X, formerly Twitter, at View from Bunker or at Derek Gilbert. Uh, Twitter, well, we already talked about that. Threads, Facebook, uh, Facebook, View from the Bunker, Threads, who cares? Truth Social, Gab, me, we get her at Derek P. Gilbert and on YouTube if you're watching there. As we said earlier, youtube.com slash at Gilbert House. Subscribe, click the bell for notifications, and then download our free app because that's how you guarantee we never get canceled. Gilberthouse.org slash app. All of our content comes straight to you. It's also got multiple Bible translations, audio Bible, that is. Uh, we've also got an articles section. We're posting new articles every week on uh, the subject, of, well, the kind of things that we write and talk about. And you'll also find there the messaging section. Up in the top right corner, there's like a little word balloon icon up there. Click that. Join the groups. Join in the conversations taking place. This is almost like a a social media site, except it's offline. It's not connected to the internet. So you can uh, ask for prayer, share concerns, share your prayers for others and with others. Uh, Ask questions directly of Sharon and me. We'll try to answer questions each week on the Gilbert House Fellowship, our weekly Bible study and PID radio. Uh, Again, gilberthouse.org slash app. You'll also find a link in the top menu bar at vftb.net. Well, Boeing has not been having a good year. A number of planes, uh, especially the 737s, have been having some trouble. But the 787 Dreamliner flying from, um, oh gosh, where was this now? This was a, uh, a, a, I believe, a case from Sydney to Auckland. Yes, in Australia. More than four dozen people were injured on this flight when it suddenly nosedived. So people were not, you know, under the keep your seatbelt on sign at all uh, directive from the, from the cockpit. Just suddenly the plane did a sudden nosedive. Letham Airlines said it was a, uh, uh, just a technical event. The Wall Street Journal reports that it was a mishap with a cockpit seat. Mishap with a cockpit seat, which might have pushed a pilot into the controls. Now, the back of the seat, according to the, the story at the Wall Street Journal, and this was based on an explanation from Boeing, uh, a flight attendant coming up there to uh, deliver a meal to the pilot may have hit a switch on the back of the seat, which forced the seat forward into the yoke, the pilot's yoke, which then caused the plane to nosedive. Now, (laughs) there's supposed to be a cover on the back of that switch, you know, covering the switch so that it doesn't accidentally get flipped. Once flipped, why was it not immediately stopped again? Because... This is like the um, the seat controls in your in your automobile. You want to control where your seat is so that you're in a comfortable driving position. Pilots, same way, they want to sit where they can you know comfortably reach the yoke and the controls. But apparently, the official explanation is that the switch controlling the seat got hit and suddenly forced the pilot slowly forward into the yoke, which then caused the plane to suddenly nosedive. Now. I've heard from some that said, okay, if it was on autopilot, the change in the yoke may have then at some point overridden the autopilot, causing the plane to try to adjust to the attitude that was indicated by the new position of the yoke. All right, maybe. I still think this is a really nonsensical explanation. The seat could not have moved that quickly. Uh, you would think that it could have been overridden quickly enough. The flight attendant realized, oh, I've accidentally triggered the seat, I need, which isn't supposed to be accessible to the attendant anyway without flipping up the cover, the safety cover, to make sure that the switch doesn't act, so that this doesn't happen. But this is the kind of thing that uh, Boeing has been going through, the panel falling off a 737 on the West Coast. Other problems, the uh, air, the, the 737 that suddenly turned into a convertible in midair a few months back. Um, about 50 people injured when this plane nosedived, including a few bo- broken bones. Nobody seriously hurt, thankfully, but still, uh, Boeing tried to explain this away. We should point out, uh, on a more serious note, that a whistleblower who brought to the attention of the public 
uh, problems with the quality control of the 787 Dreamliner. Worked at Boeing for 32 years before leaving the company in 2017. According to attorneys, was subjected to a hostile work environment because he was speaking up, saying, hey, uh, we got problems here that need to be addressed. Instead of just, you know, shut up, keep your head down, just <laughs> collect your retirement, go away. Uh, 62-year-old John Barnett found dead in his car outside a hotel in South Carolina, where the coroner has now officially ruled that the gunshot wound to his head was self-inflicted. It's also come to the attention now of the media that uh, he told a personal friend, a family friend, that if they find him dead, not to believe a suicide ruling. His attorney said that Barnett was not uh, the kind who would do such a thing. So um, not a good look, not a good year for Boeing. And I think going forward, we will be looking at um, the kind of aircraft before we fly and making sure that we're only on Airbus jets. Well, the um, Prophetic Signs in the Heavenlies Conference, Paul Begley, one of the presenters there, uh, this is coming up April 5th through 8th, so just a couple of weeks away at the Hilton DFW Lakes Conference Center in Dallas. This will be a great place to see the total eclipse of the sun. Uh, we managed. We we made sure to book our flights early to make sure that we were on a flight to Dallas because being one of the easiest places to get to in the country and uh, at the same time see the total eclipse, wanted to make sure we could actually get there. But uh, uh, if if you have not yet, uh, please see about getting there. There will be streaming video available if you can't make it. But uh, again, the benefit of being there and staying through the weekend until Monday the 8th is that you can be there with us at the hotel and watch the total eclipse from the safety of the hotel. Paul Begley, Colonel David Giamona, who will be a guest on this program with Troy Anderson in just a few weeks. They also have a book coming up in just a few weeks. Uh, they will be, uh, he will be one of the speakers, Colonel Giamona, that is. Pastor Casper McLeod, David Hevner, Dr. Kerry Mayday who uh, became rather well-known and infamous in some circles, uh, the, you know, big pharma circles, for her uh, outspoken views during the uh, lockdowns. Dave Hodges, Michael Boldea, Tuv Rose, looking forward to meeting him. John Moore, David Paxton, and uh, Doug Thornton. Uh, don't miss this. This will be a great gathering, not least of which because, again, you've got the prophetic significance, perhaps, of what is taking place on April 8th. More information and registration online at hearthewatchmen.com, hearthewatchmen.com. The Mysteries of the Bible Verse Conference, that's coming to Cincinnati June 7th and 8th. This will actually be at the Marriott Cincinnati Airport, which is in Hebron, Ohio. It's the airport for Cincinnati is across the river in Ohio. Um, this will be a, a great gathering as well. Our good friend uh, Rudy Landa, who is a film documentary film producer and director who uh, did the film with our good friend uh, Doug Van Dorn, Angels and Demons, or Angels and Giants, rather, Angels and Giants. Um, he will be one of the other speakers at the conference. I will be speaking twice, once on Friday and again on Saturday, talking about, um, well, Giants in the Bible, why they matter, and uh, uh, also, I forgot what my second topic is going to be. Oh, well, um, I'm sure it'll be... Uh, <laughs> I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, anyway, you can find information and register at uh, the website for Southwest Radio Ministries, swrc.com, swrc.com, Southwest Radio Ministries. Um, this one will not be streamed. So uh, if you're interested, you might want to get uh, your registration in, and we'll see you in early June in the Cincinnati area. The Go Therefore Conference also coming to Ohio. This is the time the Dayton area. Brookville, Ohio will be there again with Pastor Paul Begley, Dr. Michael Lake, L.A. Marzulli, Dr. Greg Reed, Pastor Carl Gallops, Dr. Judd Burton, Dr. Mike Spaulding. A great gathering for that one, July 26th and 27th, and you can find out more online at GoThereforeConference.com, GoThereforeConference.com. Skywatch TV's virtual conference, Confronting the Darkness, still on. It uh, did go uh, out to the web uh, at the end of February, but you've not lost any time. You still get 90 days access when you sign up. Uh, my presentation there on uh, the conflict in Israel and the spirits behind it. Uh, so, uh, and of course, this features Tom Horn's last presentation. So do take advantage of that at DefenderConference.com. Now, our um, 
Solidarity Mission to Israel, May 6th through 13th. We're getting a lot of queries on it. Uh, obviously, people are concerned a little bit about security. Uh, that's understandable. We're going to be talking with Aaron Lipkin this coming week and uh, presenting the video of that conversation sometime during this coming week just to show you that other than what's actually going on in and around, uh, in, well, in Gaza and uh, in the north, which is that area that was evacuated within um, uh, a, cl- a couple of clicks of, uh, of the Lebanese border, that uh, Israel is secure. It's just that people right now are intimidated, and so the hotels are empty. Israel's economy is struggling. We're putting together a tour to visit some of the sites that were affected directly on October 7th. Sterot, a couple of the kibbutzim in the south, in the Negev. Uh, on that day that we go down there, we're, going to, we're planning a barbecue with soldiers in the IDF and uh, finding out what life is like for them. Um, one of the archaeologists that we met during our tour last year was actually called up in the reserves and was deployed to Gaza. Out of 9 million people in Israel, a million have been mobilized into the reserves, which gives you an idea of what the economy is struggling with when you've got that many people who've been pulled away from their regular jobs and uh, put back into service. We will also go to Tel Aviv, Hostage Square, the uh, Nova Music Festival exhibit there. We will go to the uh, uh, the site of Gush Etzion, which was a key, key battle in uh, 1948, a uh, really heartbreaking uh, struggle. It's like Israel's Alamo, really. Uh, I, I challenge you to go to Gush Etzion, see that exhibit, and come out with dry eyes. You just, you, you, it's not possible. It's not possible. And then in Jerusalem, we'll go to the Temple Mount. We will go to the Mount of Olives. We'll go to the Western Wall. We'll go to the Western Wall Tunnels. We will go to the Israel Museum and a, a wonderful exhibit there, memorial for the Holocaust. And again, come out of there with dry eyes. I don't, I, I don't think so. This will be a powerful one-week experience showing solidarity with Israel and just praying for peace there, though we know that ultimately peace will only come when our Lord and Savior returns at the head of his uh, heavenly army. Our full tour of Israel, uh, we've now pushed it back from November to next spring. This is the Iron and Myth Tour. Next, March 25th through April 3rd, uh, this will feature Doug Van Dorn and Judd Burton, and uh, Timothy Alberino will be joining us as well. Uh, his tours have been backed up twice now from this March to November and now to next March. So Tim is going to join us along with Doug and uh, Judd. In a sense, Tim Alberino playing the role of Brian Gadawa on the Iron and Myth Tour. More information at gilberthouse.org slash travel, which is also where you'll find information on the Solidarity Mission to Israel. gilberthouse.org slash travel. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to watch or listen. We do appreciate that. Give us a thumbs up or a review at uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, Pandora, wherever fine podcasts are sold. Our announcer is the inimitable DC Good. And A View from the Bunker is a production of Gilbert House Ministries, released under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial, No Derivatives 4.0 International License. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Good night, Oliver, wherever you are. I'm Derek Gilbert. This is a view from the bunker.